I need to know everything Who and the what and the where I need everything Trust me, I hear what you're saying But I like it's new what you're telling me I'm curious, George. I hop in the Porsche, five and a horse. I'm ready for war. I'm coming Hello for the Hello and to welcome. I need to know JK plus one. Um, I am not your host, PTF. I recorded this really fast. So I was uh, this intro, so I was not prepared to make a joke, but it's not going to be hard to do. Uh, I saw Pete. He had his little hat on. He he loves that little hat, doesn't he? He even he even has irrelevant people on the interwebs. Uh, using fedora is like a punchline, and it's all because of Pete. You're famous, Pete. You made it, right? Uh, I am your host, Jonathan Kinchin, and uh, I am back with you, not in the Brooklyn bunker. I'm in the Planet Texas at the moment, and this is an episode that I'm very excited about because it is the reason that I did this podcast, JK Plus One, the reason that I wanted to do a longer form uh, podcast because I think that it allows people to see another side of uh, the faces and the names we see in racing that is more complex than the post race post uh, post race post award lead up to a race. How's your horse doing? How are you training? What do you hope for from a trip standpoint? And I don't mean that disparagingly against. Uh, the wonderful people in this industry that, that do those interviews. I'm just saying they're just short and, and, and the, 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 the trainers are nervous and, you know, it's public and it's, there's just no, there's not a, a, an opportunity to elaborate and, and to, to, to learn more about uh, these individuals in the game. And uh, Brendan Walsh, who I think most would think is, is, is a quote unquote quiet character in the game. Uh, I'm excited about the hour and 20. So 20, hour and 15 minutes that we did together that uh, shows a different dimension. And, and it's why um, why I was excited uh, about having him on and, and doing this podcast in general. I uh, want to make sure that we thank our friends at Qatar Racing, uh, Sheikh Fahad, and, uh, and the, the, the SAMR. You'll know more about that, SAMR, self-appointed. I won't even ruin it. I'm not going to ruin the joke. The joke. Uh, S S A R M S A R M SARM. Want to thank the SARM as well. Um, you'll you'll get that joke later, so don't just relax. But uh, Qatar Racing, um, and one of their trainers, Brendan Walsh, was not planned. It was just uh just worked out. And and I and I, I tell you why Brendan and I are friends because he gives good info, and I, I touch on that in this uh in this call uh as well. Um, yeah, I'm excited to have Brendan Walsh. Excited to talk about Max Field, excited to talk about uh, Dubai, and we're not going to fault him for dodging a couple of stories, but uh, apparently they weren't uh, safe for these networks, and uh, maybe we'll get him uh, another time. Brendan, what's going on? Oh, everything's good, John. I'm just uh, back in Kentucky here for a few days. I was in New Orleans at the weekend, so um, back to see the horses at Turfway, and um um, you know, the, we do a lot of traveling over the winter, so it just uh, it just keeps rolling along. Um, but you know, everything's going good at the moment, or for the most part, anyway. I don't know what it is when I talk to anyone who's who's Irish or British. I just always I instantly feel smarter. Do you, you guys hate our accent, don't you? You can be honest. No, I I can't say I do. Um, <laughs> some of them, some of them I do, but. Uh, no, for the most part, not not really. You know, um, I don't know. I, I everybody still tells me I've got a strong accent. Um, I guess when I go back to Ireland, everybody tells me I've got an American accent. Or I think the expressions are uh, you pick up a lot of expressions here, um, the same as I do. You know, I, I use a lot of Irish expressions too, and it uh, people look at me like I've got three heads. Um, <laughs> you know, but. Uh, but yeah, you know, it's all all part of it, you know. Well, you know, people who listen to my show know that I, I, I try to like I try to find people around the person I'm talking with to give me good stories to get them going. And the first thing I have to say oh, is that everyone I talk to refers to you and I knew this anyways, but it's just funny. They refer to you as snapper. They don't refer snapper. to you as Brendan or Walsh. They refer to you as snapper. Where did snapper come from? 
Um, contrary to what a lot of people think or, or make up, Snapper got hung on me by, um, you know, Garrett O'Rourke, who manages Judmont. Um, well, Brian O'Rourke, who's a full brother of Garrett's, um, we worked together in um, in Coolmore years ago. John, it must be, God, it must be 25 years ago now. But there was a movie out in Ireland at the time uh, called The Snapper. And it was about a, a, a girl in the inner city, Dublin, um, who they, they had a, a chip van, you know, like as we as we'd say, we call them chip vans at home. They, they sell French fries and burgers and stuff. But she got pregnant by, by they didn't know who to. Years ago, we were working in, uh, I was working in Coolmore with, uh, with uh, Brian O'Rourke, who's a full brother of, of Garrett O'Rourke, who manages Judmont. Um, and uh, and Liam O'Rourke, who manages Darley in in Newmarket, but uh, very well bred, by the way. But um, so there was a movie out at the time about um, about a girl they owned a a chip van. You know, they sell burgers and French fries out of these vans in Ireland, and and she became pregnant by they didn't know who the father was. There was a lot of a lot of different stories, but anyway, the the baby or the fetus as it was then it got referred to as the snapper and and i was um i was uh by far the the smallest i was probably one of the youngest two working in coolmore at the time so uh brian o hung hung that on me uh way back when and and i wasn't called it for years until i I pretty much came back to the states, and then everybody he he I stayed with him when I came back here initially, and um, and he he stuck it back on me again, and it's kind of stuck with me ever since. So um, it's nothing nothing too bad, uh, Jonathan. You know, just um, just that. You know, <laughs> I I didn't know that you uh, you worked at Coolmore. I mean, was it a, was it just kind of an introductory young kind of position, or what what did you do when you were at Coolmore? I mucked out a lot of stalls. Um, yeah, we we you know I went through a little a little term there when I was younger where I did a lot of uh, of work on stud farms. I did the Irish National Stud Management course um, in ninety one. I think it was ninety one or ninety two, and and I believe after that I I did a stud season in in Coolmore, but um, there wasn't enough uh, there wasn't enough action in it for me. Um, so I went back down the 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 racing um, the racing route, as it were, again, um, you know. Uh, but it was a good it was actually a good a good thing to do and a good thing to see. You know, you got to work around obviously some great stallions and some some great mares, as just to make the connections that we made. You know, I made some some great friends back there that that still to this. Um, any of that is never never any harm now they did work the as we'd say in Ireland they worked the shite out of me but um but it was good and it was good fun and like I said we made some great friends in that and um and they've remained to this day well oh, I'm gonna jump into to one of 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 my favorite horses that you trained and I know there's a lot of other ones but and, and I'm gonna just come out and ask you straight up uh, how many links were you going to win the 2019 Breeders' Cup Juvenile by if Maxfield wouldn't have been sidelined? Say that again, Jonathan. I lost you there for a while. Uh, how, how many lengths were you going to win the 2019 Juvenile by if Maxfield wasn't sidelined? Um, I don't know. You know, it was still, it was still a race to be won. Um, none of them are ever easy. Uh, we still had to go all the way out to California to try try to win it, and and I think it's a it's a hard thing to do regardless of how uh, how good a horse you have. But you know, it looked at the time like he was going to be the the horse that everybody had to beat. Um, you know, unfortunately, um, he he met with injury as as you know. I think he, his his career was a little bit uh, compromised by by injury, but. Um, yeah, it was it was a shame, you know. In in hindsight, I mean, the way he won at uh, at Keeneland, um, 
it looked like he was the horse everybody had to beat and you know it would have been would have been nice to get him there um a hundred percent but unfortunately we we met with that setback and 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 that was that but uh yeah that was a tough tough few days for sure tell, tell me uh, uh you know not to bring it back up but tell me about those days like did you did you was it just one of those mornings the phone rings and you're like oh damn here we go or and and, and was there any conversation or was it a kind of one of those slam dunk deals where the issue was the issue and there was no conversation to be had and and, and, and how did you relay that information to the Godolphin team? What, what were those few days like? No, it was, it was, you know, we got out there, John and I flew out to the, to the, to California with the horse on the, on the plane. And, uh, you know, we, we got out there and we, we brought him out in the track the next, the first day, I think. And, you know, he was fine. He jogged, he was fine. We brought him out the next day and he galloped a little bit. And and very unlike him, he got very hot, and and I thought, you know, you, you know, first time in the place, it it was warm, you know, you you don't take that much notice. But the next day, I I I think it was I noticed he wasn't quite a hundred percent when he jogged, and and I thought first of all, you know, the first thing you go for is obviously a foot because there was nothing to be seen on on any of his legs. And this this just shows what kind of a, how fickle an animal we're dealing with. You know, there wasn't anything obvious there. So I thought, me, oh, hopefully it's it's just a foot. Maybe there's an abscess or he's bruised a foot, stood in a stone, something like that. You know, but again, he got a little hot and that wasn't like Max at all. He he was the coolest horse in the world. And, and I thought there's something not quite right here. And, uh, you know, we looked into it um the following morning we took some x-rays and and we noticed that there was just a little line on the on the bottom of his cannon bone and and he was starting to to there was starting to uh, a condylar was starting to form um so after that th- there was no debate you know we we weren't going to go any further i i called jimmy bell um jimmy was actually out there at the time and i called jimmy and i said i think we've got a you know we do have an issue here of course um, Rod, the Godolphin vet, was was helping me as well. Um, so you know, we 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 X-rayed him and and we saw this. And after that, it it wasn't an issue. We just had no other option but to uh, but to scratch the horse. And it was you know it was very disappointing at the time. Um, you know, but I'm glad we we spotted it, Jonathan. And I'm glad you know that that we 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 did see it because. Um, Initially, it it wasn't something that that jumped right out at you, and and a lot of the time there isn't an obvious sign of these things, and that's why sometimes we we get these catastrophic um, breakdowns and things because there's just sometimes there's just no way of telling. But uh, but thank God we saw this, and and we brought him back, and we gave him the time, and and let it heal, and and we were able to come back with the horse again, which. Um, you know, it happened to him twice in his career, and and you know, like I said, I think, I think the horse was a little curtailed by the whole thing. To do what he did, but but who knows what he would have done had he not met with that initial uh, initial injury, you know. Uh, most disappointing event in your training career when, when you had to scratch him that day or does something else kind of sneak up or, or is that right up there with him? Well, we brought two horses out um, to the, um, to the Breeders' Cup that year. Um, and the other, the other colt that we brought out for the, um, for the juvenile turf as well. Um, unfortunately, he was scratched out there as well. And uh, so that was very very disappointing few days i mean it was it was super super disappointing um you know he he wasn't the greatest mover in the world um you know the vets weren't happy with him and and uh they decided the morning of the race that they wanted to um to scratch him as well um so that on top of of what happened with maxfield it was really a, a pretty pretty much a nightmare um a nightmare affair really um you know so between the whole lot it was very disappointing but 
you know what <clears throat> what can you do you just uh you learn to to take these things and you you put it down to experience and and uh you move on you know thankfully we we got both horses back um back again uh you know the following year and and the you know maxfield obviously um that's uh that's um history at this stage yeah and of course um vitalogy as well when we we were out there he got scratched as well by the by the vets um which i was very disappointed with at the time because um you know the horse was not the prettiest moving horse in the world um you know i guess they they didn't know the horse we felt the horse was fine but they scratched the horse the morning of the race so that added to the whole maxfield thing was um was a very very disappointing few days um and, and Brendan, I, I look i don't want to you know put you in one of those situations and and feel free to dodge this as as, as much as you want to but like you know, we've, we've heard this a few times and, and we understand why it exists, right? Like there's this, you know, we, we, you know, the, the, obviously the horse safety is the most important thing more than anything else. But, you know, I think there is something to be said from talking to trainers like yourself and others that, that recognize that, 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 that a, an, an odd way of going does not mm -hmm. necessarily mean they're unsound and only seeing them for one day and not the other 700 and plus days of their lives or careers can, can, can make you not understand what you're looking at. You know, how, where do you, how do you feel about that? I, I think I know, but how do you, how do you feel about that idea? I, I mean, you know, Jonathan, we're the, like, I scratched Maxfield at the, at the Breeders' Cup that year. I, I saw that he was lame. He, there was obviously an issue, so I, I, I'm not, I wouldn't dream of running a horse that I don't think is 100%, but there's, there's such a thing as a lame horse, and there's a, a horse that's not lame. I didn't feel that Vitalogy was lame when we went out there uh, that year. That's, that's the way he went to me. You know, I know the horse. I look at the horse every, every day of the week. Um, you know, so... This is this is the problem, you know, and and I can understand where they're coming from too, you know. They're they're not some of these horses are not the prettiest moving horse, but so, so I've seen some great horses that weren't very particularly good movers, um, you know. And and I don't know how we're going to come around it, but you know, I think there definitely has to be something, uh, you know, we have to have to come to some uh thing with with these vets that that maybe a vet who watches the horses train a lot you know they ask us for our own vets to look at horses too uh before they're entered etc there's different rules at different tracks and and our own vets you know they sign they sign forms and they you know they declare these horses sound and what have you and they've actually got a better idea than anybody of the way a horse goes um so i don't know if they should be brought into it more but i I just feel sometimes too that that the trainers don't have a leg to stand on. That there's never any um, there's never any comeback. You know, these guys come in, they they declare our horses unsound, and and then we have to turn around and we have to get them back off of the vets list, um, which takes another two weeks. You know, uh, and and it's it's tough on owners, and it's it's very, um, you know. It, 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 it's very uh if it, it flattens a lot of owners and 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 you know i think it's a i think we've got to come to some kind of a medium with this um jonathan you know because it, it's happening all the time now you know and you turn around you work a horse back off the vets list there's never a, there's not a problem you know they come back again and they they run again and it just seems like a lot of the time we have to go through this process for no reason whatsoever and i think we need to it's it's something that needs to be um, addressed and and something that that needs to be taken care of um, because we're going to lose a lot of owners because of it. Yeah, my my fear too is like I, I feel like it it's uh, it gives like a it, it kind of gives it, it gives the wrong perception that you know that like a yeah. trainer puts a, a you know is trying to like jam a horse in. 
And because of the way that they go about it, mm-hmm. it just that you know, and obviously that's not what was happening. But you know, I even you know, friendly with Chad Brown with with with, with Jack Christopher, and it's like he's trying to jam this horse in here mm-hmm. who's not sound. Chad doesn't want the horse to break down. He's got stallion rights to the, to the horse. Why the hell would he try to jam the horse into this spot? And um, I, I just think that you know, I, I, I see your point. I, I feel like it gives the wrong perception, but. To your, like you said, it, it's a rock and a hard place because it, it obviously, you know, unfortunately in this game that you the animal has to be protected because the, uh, there's the there's the one percent or two percent that will do something nefarious and like you got to kind of protect them. But I, I feel like the process might need to be a little bit different. Yeah, for sure. Um, you know, like I said, there's. There's never any any comeback with us. And and listen, you're you are dealing with a, a short time span. You know, they're looking at these horses the morning of a race. If they're in doubt, um, what they feel is um, you know, and 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 to come to some kind of a of a, a conclusion here and and you know i don't know they they i think our own vets should be should be brought into it a, a little bit more and 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 asked to look at these horses of course then you've got um you know you you're you're going to get clashes as well i i don't know if there is a right or a wrong answer but it, they've gotten very um you know it, it's it's they've become very strict and and like years ago you you didn't have uh it wasn't as strict and and i don't feel that you had um yeah you you probably had more more breakdowns and stuff that uh that you you maybe don't have now but um i mean you know there's just got to be a little bit more of uh you know where like you look at a horse and like if a horse is lame a horse is lame if they're not lame they're not lame some of them have short way of going shuffly way of going you know they get warmed up and what have you and and then they're fine the the easy thing for for the vets i guess is to is to scratch them but you know like you say it uh you know then you then you call an owner you say that the horse has been scratched down at uh you know before a race or whatever and, and you know it gives them a a, a bad perception maybe of you then like oh my horse is lame but you know it, it's hard to explain to people who are not horsemen the situation that you're in and it puts you in a bad spot brennan in, in your time being around horses um and, and i do want to get back to your to your start uh it sounds like mark wallace uh at new market was kind of your start but before we get there the best horse you can think of that that kind of had a shitty way of going, you know, the, the best horse you can think of that um, whether it was yours or, or another person's horse that was just a great horse that just didn't, didn't, didn't jog well, didn't gallop well, but uh, when the gates open, they could run. I think, you know, Vitalogy wasn't, a, hadn't a pretty way of going, but he, he wasn't bad by any means. Um, we had a we had a horse when I worked for Mark Wallace, a very very good sprinter called Ben Ben Bon. Not he wasn't that bad a moving horse, but he was over on his knees and you know. yeah. So Ben Bon, he he was uh, you know you talk about horses. He's just a horse that comes to mind because he was such a fantastic horse. Um, you know he 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 didn't have a bad way of going. He he actually was a pretty good moving horse but he was over on his knees and he would have been a horse that you know people would have maybe knocked at a sail or whatever um but uh yeah because when he'd stand up sometimes his leg would shake back and forth um but he it didn't stop him running because he won the prix de l'abbe in in long sham he won like multiple multiple group races in in europe and one of one of the most fantastic horses but you know if he was a horse was around here now um you know he they, they you know you could have maybe knocked him but to be fair i guess he wasn't a bad moving horse really so but you know you, the horses they're you know they're so different to all of them and they've just got different ways and i think that's what causes a lot of a lot of the uh if you like to call it confusion um 
you know, and and like a horse like Vitalogy was not a pretty moving horse. You know, Joseph O'Brien had him before I had him. And when I told Joseph I met him in the lobby of the hotel the morning he got scratched, I said to him, you know, they weren't happy with how he's moving. He said, well, Brendan, he was never the prettiest moving horse anyway. You know, we had the the situation this year with uh, with Chad, like you mentioned, uh, Jonathan, you know, I remember Aiden O'Brien that year that Vitalogy was scratched. He he said the same. He had a Philly scratch that year as well. You know, horses coming to the end of a long year and and they're not the prettiest moving horses, but they, you know, they're horses in their last runs. Um, they're after winning grade ones and 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 group ones in Europe, and and they're not going to bring them all the way out here if they if they don't think they're one hundred and ten percent sound. Yeah, I mean, it's, 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 you know, look, like we said, it is what it is. We, we understand why it exists, but uh, I think the conversation can, can, can kind of halt it. There's probably a better way of doing it and, and, and hopefully they'll figure that out. Um, it, as far as, as Mark Wallace, uh, I, I, I talked to your good friend, Fergus Galvin, um, who oh God. I know you, you go way back with, but he, he well, he, well, first of all, he said, you got to talk to snapper about Mark Wallace and, and what he learned being with Mark Wallace. And then he said, nightlife aside, you got to still talk to him about, <laughs> about Mark Wallace. Yeah. No, um, Mark to, to this day remains one of my best friends. Um, you know, we were, we're both pretty much the same age. Um, I had come to a point I was in, I was working for in Dubai um and i was working for godolphin and and um you know i had spent like nine winters in dubai jonathan and i was i was coming to a point where you know if i was going to try and make a a run towards training i had to uh i had to go down a different a different route because you know it, it, dubai was fantastic you know and 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 what it's led me to now um you know, it it all worked out like really well, but I got to a point where I, you know, I had to uh, to take the next step or or not, and um, you know, I was I was at a point in Dubai where I I kind of, you know, I couldn't keep going out there for the winters. I had to I had to really put my head down and 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 start to learn the the business. And um, at the time, Mark, who I knew fairly well um but you know we didn't we weren't the friends that we've we've turned out to be since um he was starting to do really really well in new market you know a young guy he was starting to win a lot of races and he was looking for an assistant so um a, a friend of mine at the time um he still is a great friend of mine ted durkin he was a fantastic jockey in europe rode for henry cecil for a couple of years Ted came to me and he said, oh, Mark is looking for a, an assistant. So, um, you know, I, I went back and I called Mark and, and he said, yeah, come on, we'll, we'll uh, you know, I can do with the help. So I um, I went back to Newmarket that uh, that spring going into into my first year with him. And I ended up spending, I think, three and a half or four years in Newmarket with him. And, uh, you know, they were fantastic years because I was. I was put in at you know where at ground level, and I saw exactly you know Mark had had some very very good clients and some big owners and and some not so so big owners. So it it gave me a good a good look at it from a the perspective of somebody who was starting off and starting to do well. Um, and believe me, we did have a lot of entertainment along the way too. Like I said, we were. We were both, God, we were, we were, you know, 30, 35 at the time. So as you can imagine, uh, there was a lot more stories um, to go with it too, because I actually ended up, you know, we used to be, uh, we were roomies and, uh, and we used to hang out a lot together as well. And um, there, there's a lot of stories that, that I wouldn't like to, uh, to mention on here, Jonathan. Uh, <laughs> um, but uh, but it was it was great it was great uh, it was great fun. But in the same hand, it was a great education for me too. You know, um, like I said, I I saw it. Um, I saw what it was like from from the perspective of somebody who was trying to get going in that. And 
And Mark was a fantastic, uh, he was a fantastic horseman. Um, you know, he trained Ben Bon, who was who was a top top sprinter. He won he won a Group One for him. Um, and I was around some great people. I made some great friends. Stephen Hillen, who's a, a great client of mine, him and him and Mark um, did a lot of work together. Um, you know, so I I got to know Steve, and and you know, a lot of these people that that you meet along the way, they're they're as well as becoming great friends. They're they're great. Uh, edu- they were great education for me too, and he, and a lot of them have stuck with me, and and have been been a very big help to me even to this day. You know, I still have some some horses for for Steve and and that, and uh, you know, but they they kind of they, you know they. They design, they design your life, and 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 they, uh, they, you know, they just, you know, it's difficult to explain. They just set things out for you without trying to set them out for you. But, uh, but, um, you know, they were they were great days back then, and and of course, Newmarket was great, and we got to witness a lot of great, um, great stuff. You know, Royal Ascot and 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 the the racing in general in Europe. You know. Ben Bond used to run a lot of the Curra in Ireland. We got to go back to the Curra. Of course, I was a great friend of mine was um, the late Patrick Smullen, and he actually used to ride Ben Bond, um, Jonathan, and uh, you know, so Pat rode multiple stakes wins on the on the horse, and Jamie Spencer too, of course, who's another great pal of mine. So, you know, obviously we made some great connections and and had some great fun along the way. I've never been uh, to Newmarket, but l- let's just say I was going, and you know, and I I enjoy an adult beverage. I, I enjoy some good food. Let's 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 detour a little bit here and give me some. Uh, what's the best way to do Newmarket? Like, what's the best way? To, where do you hang out? Where do you eat? Where do you drink? How did how did you uh, how did you do Newmarket? How would you do it now if you went over? Um. <laughs> How how we did do market back then? I think I'd be doing it a lot differently now. Um, you know, we've we've obviously uh, grown a lot older and 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 moved on. But um, no, it it is a it is a great place. Um, you know, it's the capital, probably the capital of of European racing. Really, like it's the it's the biggest training center. I mean, all the all the big trainers are there. You know, John Gosden, Michael Stout, or Mark Prescott huge huge um yards i mean it's totally different to to what you see here in the mornings john you have to go at some point um and see it because it is it is a magical place you know springtime when the the spring is coming in and they're moving towards the the guineas uh the, the days of the 1000 2000 guineas you know the whole way through the summer it's uh there's a great buzz around the place um i was lucky enough a couple of years ago, I, I was lucky enough to go back and run um, Extravagant Kid in the July Cup. And, and um, you know, that was that for me was great to be able to go back there and, and actually run a horse. I ran him in Royal Ascot, too. But unfortunately, the whole COVID thing was going on at the time and I didn't actually make it to Royal Ascot. Um, but, you know, it is it is a, a great place. We've I've had some great memories there. We've been back for a lot of sales since. If I was you, Jonathan, I would go back there, you know, for like the guineas or for one of the of the major sales, like the July sale or the September sale, um, you know, food wise and stuff like that. It's not the greatest place on earth, but there's some great there's some great restaurants outside of the town. Um, you know, it's not far from London. Uh, it's an easy place to get to, but I I would strongly advise you at some stage just for the experience to uh, to try to go because it is uh, it is something to see. How how far is it from London? Is, I mean, I'm assuming is it, is it a train to London or a car? Or what do you what do you do? Yeah, you can get a train. Um, it's like an hour an hour train ride, an hour an hour and a half in a car. Um, you know, uh, but there yeah, you can get a train from from. Cambridge is is only twenty minutes away. Where of course they have the world famous um, Cambridge University, and uh, yeah, it's only an hour away. I mean, I used to go down to I we used to go down to London a lot uh, when I was in Newmarket. But I, I'm a big Arsenal fan of the soccer team, so 
I had good access to tickets back then and, and we used to go down and watch Arsenal all the time. It's it's just an hour really, you know. I, I heard you were I heard you were a gunner. Uh Thierry Henry, one of your favorites? Magical days, Jonathan. Um, you know, I was lucky enough when we were in when we were in uh, Newmarket at the time, they were in their prime. They got beaten a Champions League final. It was the furthest they got, which uh, which absolutely killed me at the time. It was like, you know, it was a disaster. Uh, Barcelona beat them in the final. Mark always claims that he caught me crying that night after the game, but that's that's not that's not right. I didn't I didn't actually cry. I was pretty close to tears, but I didn't, I didn't quite cry. But but I, I, I used to go down there a lot. My my brother um is a big Arsenal fan as well and he used to come over from Ireland for weekends and that and we'd go down there and we just absolutely loved it. I, I loved it. And it was so nice too, because they were in their prime at the time and you know, I, I don't follow it as much as I used to back then, but I still especially the last year or two they've gotten good now again so I'm kind of they're after peaking my interest again you know so um you know but they were they were fantastic days for sure and just great great days out you know we'd go down we'd you know we'd have a few beers and and go to the game and maybe then go down into London after and it was just uh it was great fun so you talked you talked a little bit about new market. Um, I had Kieran uh, McLaughlin on the show, and we talked about his time in Dubai. But he was, you know, married, family. Uh, tell me a little bit about Dubai as a thirty-something. Uh, did you was that a was that a? I've never been. Uh, my brother is a funny enough. My brother's like a DJ, a pretty big DJ, and he he's played in in Dubai. A few times he's got some really wild stories in fact about it's an interesting place did you did you love your time there and and, and how was that as a as a as a young uh young fella yeah i mean we loved it there jonathan you know we when we went there there wasn't there wasn't an awful lot there um i went out there i think my first year out there was the second world cup sing singspiel won the world cup the year i was i was there um so I think it, it must have been, um, you know, late 90s. Um, but, uh, you know, there wasn't a whole lot there when we went out there first. There was, you know, a few high rise buildings downtown. We lived in the World Trade Center apartments. Um, and down the way, there was three towers that Emirates Airlines were starting off at the time as well. Um, and and there was three towers full of Emirates um, flight attendants, um, so you can imagine now they were they were uh, they were pretty easy on the eye, um, and we used to all hang out. There was an Irish bar kind of in between the whole lot, um, and we used to all hang out in the Irish bar, and and we had great fun. I mean, great fun, and we we wa basically watched Dubai grow up because. Uh, when I went there first, you could go from one side of the city to the other side in twenty minutes. Um, now it it it's not not as easy. Now it's it's unbelievable. I mean, it's a metropolis now. I mean, I I went back the year that Plus Caparfe won the Derby out there, and I couldn't believe it because I hadn't been back there for probably eight or nine years, Jonathan. And it was uh, it was like being you know we went downtown um, a couple of times. It was like being downtown manhattan um so you know i worked out in jebel ali for a couple of years and uh there was nothing from dubai out to jebel ali there was nothing now it's just all built up i mean it's massive but we had great time there we we had a great time like i said there was a lot of expats out there you know whether they were emirates emirates people you know emirates was just getting going at the time so i think they had like the only flight Emirates might have had at the time was between London and Dubai. Now they go all over the world. It's a massive, massive airline, as we know. Um, you know, but a lot of business has set up in Dubai since as well. And the place has just grown into a, a massive, massive place. But but yeah, we had great fun out there. A lot of people used to come out on on vacation and and uh and that during the winter. I mean, it's a huge uh destination for for Europeans you get an awful lot of Europeans go to Dubai and in fact it's hard to find anybody that hasn't been to Dubai anymore um, from Europe um, 
so but it uh it was a it was a great spot and like i said we had great fun out there you know you you we played a lot of golf back then of course i didn't have a whole lot to worry about back then i was a rider and that was that was kind of it so there wasn't the uh the responsibility or the workload that we have now so um you know it was a lot more uh a lot more fun and yeah we did have some good uh we had some good nights out there and, and made some great friends you know when you think back to you know and I'll, I'll i'll go european for this analogy when you think of these you know young footballers growing up they think about uh, the red and white of, of arsenal or the the red and white of of, of manchester united or yeah, they, they you know these these colors that mean that you've made it if you've somehow found them on your back I would imagine that for a horse trainer, um, legging up a rider with the royal blue of Godolphin, uh, and also uh, the, the the maroon of our friends at Qatar Racing, and uh, the, the the green and pink of Judmont, there there's got to be a, a feeling of of success that that comes with that. Tell me a little bit about how Godolphin, Qatar, uh, how did all of these operations come to to having horses in your barn and 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 um how surreal were those those moments as a young trainer yeah you know godolphin um jonathan as as we we all know they've been around quite a bit now um you know i mean my my whole career really has has been you know like for literally since I was in my early twenties, I've I worked at Kildangan Stud in Ireland, um, you know, for for that which is Sheikh Mohammed's stud. Um, I had my introduction to Dubai through um, Godolphin. We brought some some two year olds out there one year. Um, so you know the whole the whole uh, the whole Godolphin thing and 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 Sheikh Mohammed have been a huge. Uh, huge influence on my whole career from from start to finish and and everything we did you know it, it's just it's a privilege you know like you you just get to work around the most fantastic horses the most fantastic people um like you say it's 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 a little surreal i, I was looking um in palm meadows recently i was looking at the the colors um that we're lucky enough to have in the in the barn um anymore you know uh like you know like you say godolphin qatar um any of them i mean it's 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 unbelievable really when you stop and think about it um which i don't have time to do an awful lot but i've been very very lucky jonathan um you know and and with them colors and and with them operations come some some very good horses i got lucky um you know i guess it's five years ago now we we brought plus Caparfe um out to the to dubai for the the uae derby and he won and and when we came back i got approached by godolphin to to take some horses for them um i don't know if it was the whole thing of of going to dubai that year that that swung it in my direction but they were they were starting to make a, a switch back to uh to kentucky anyway the you know the, the i think they they wanted to have more of a presence in kentucky you know the money the prize money had gotten a lot better here um you know and then kieran of course um as we mentioned earlier kieran was retiring and and uh you know that kind of um you know maybe took them out of new york a little bit too although they still have plenty of presence in new york with with billy mott but uh you know I maybe I got lucky at the right time, but I've been lucky enough since, you know, every year uh, since I started training for them, I've been lucky enough to uh, to have some very good horses, um, you know. So so that was uh, that was uh, Godolphin, um, Qatar, of course. Um, you know, Fergus, who we mentioned earlier, um, he takes care of all of of Qatar stuff in in the states. Um, you know, he also takes care of Mark the Temple stuff. Who, are, you know, these guys have become very good friends of mine as much as anything. Um, Jonathan and, you know, I got to know. Well, I knew Fergus for a long time. I actually knew Fergus when we were back in, uh, 
in Ireland years ago. We used to, I won't say we hung out a lot together, but we knew, you know, we worked in some of similar places. We knew a lot of, we had a lot of mutual friends. So basically, like a lot of, of the guys in Kentucky and in Lexington, um, they've been a big help to me since I came over. But we, you know, we, we, we've had some luck along the way. We've had some fun along the way. Fergus was taking care of, of Sheik Fahad stuff, um, you know, and they, and they started to send me a few horses, I guess, God, I must have horses, four, five years, six years now. Um, we got very lucky the, the first uh, couple of years they sent me horses. I know we won the, the sprint in, in Kentucky Downs two years in a row. I think it was Sheik Fahad's third year in a row, um, the last time we won uh, down there. Um, so, you know, we, we've gotten lucky and, and of course, um, we've had a great relationship along the way and, and, um, you know, John and I, I just, I've just been very, very lucky with all the connections and all the people I've met along the way. And, uh, thank God it, it's all worked out and, and hopefully it keeps going and, and, and we can, uh, we can have a lot of success together in the future as well. Now I gotta, I gotta ask you this because I, I tried to get it out of Kieran. and he I think he worked for Sheikh Mohammed at a different time. But let's just say that you book a flight on Emirates and uh, you get put in coach. Do you have a phone number that you can call <laughs> that, that sorts that out for you? Get you put in first class. Well. Back in the day, we had them Emirates girls. Um, they used to they used to try and push us up the front of the plane as as much as they could. And if if they couldn't, um, they they used to bring a lot of uh, a lot of the beer and champagne and stuff to the back. So it was like being on business class. But uh, uh, I don't know. I mean, the, you know, we 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 uh, we don't have a direct connection really. But uh, you know, when when I went out for the the UAE Derby with Tusca Parfait, we couldn't have been treated better. Of course, we were flown out there business class and all, but um, do I have a direct connection? Not really, but, um, you know, we always seem to wrangle our way um, up there some somewhere or another we managed <laughs> to uh, to make it work. <laughs> well, Bob Baffert will tell you that he's only alive because of Shane Bob, yeah. so... Yeah, exactly, exactly. Oh, That's true. Yeah, but no, oh, listen, they're they're great. I mean, I, you know, like I said, I I've been very lucky, Jonathan. I mean, uh, you know, between them and 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 Qatar and and everybody, you know, I just been uh, count myself as very lucky, and and we've we've been lucky enough to come up with the right horses, um, you know, the last few years as well. And like I said, you know, long may it continue. Well, before I forget, I, I do want to tell you that, that you do you're you're nominated for an award, in my opinion, as the best one of the best trainers that I text and say, "Are you live or not?" That gives the best info, like that you, <laughs> you, you know, because I think a lot of trainers are really good horsemen. They know who they have. But mm -hmm. there's a, you know, there is some trainers that I'll reach out to or talk to about first time starters or whatever that they're, I, I think they know what they have. I'm never obviously talking that they don't know what they're talking about, but I think that they are not sure who they're in against. And I don't think that they read the form as well, but you, you, um, you don't lead astray too often. So I wanted to just let you know you're nominated for uh, best trainer info. They they might not have been around Mark Wallace and Stephen Hillen enough, um, Jonathan. <laughs> you know, they 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 were probably not chastised um, enough when they got it wrong. Um, <laughs> so that'll that'll, uh, that'll 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 get you right. That'll turn you into a pretty good handicapper. Although well, it's contrary to you know, Fergus tells me that whenever I tell him a horse is live anymore, he goes the other way and and he he goes against it. And when I tell him one has no shot, he he goes and bets on it, but he'd say that anyway. Fergus is 0 for 1 for me in the last month. So, you know. Yeah, yeah. Well, there, you go. <laughs> there you go. That tells you well, story. One of your best handicapping jobs, I, I would have to say, uh, looking at, you know, Fergus pointed this one out for me. I looked at the past performances and holy wow. 
what you did with Cary Street, claim the horse for 10000 and then went on to win the Breeders' Cup Marathon, which Mark the Temple also told me was a story in itself for a celebration, but we'll get to that after we talk about the horse. Did When you claimed him, did you think he's a good horse, I'm going to win races with him, or did you claim him thinking – I'm going to go 12 furlongs and win big races. Or What was your mindset when you grabbed Kerry Street? My mindset at the time, Jonathan, was just to win a race with the horse. Um, and I, I, I remember it like it was yesterday. I went down and, and uh, I brought Gatto with me, who still works for me to this day. And we went down and claimed the horse so under the advice of a friend of mine, um, Stephen Skaggs, because he, he the horse was running a one turn mile. He said, this horse needs to go a lot further. He'll get beat today. And at, he'll be favorite. He'll get beat. And he said, you're running back two turns and he'll win. He was in for 10 grand. So I uh, I went down and I dropped the slip on him. And by God, did he get beat? He was beaten from here to the, the end of the street. Um, and I remember holding him for a bath after and, and this and 10 grand is still a lot of money in, in any terms. But at the time I did not have 10 grand to throw away and he was acting cheap, John. And I was looking at him like things were just not going very well at the time. And I remember thinking to myself, my God, this is all I need now. And after losing another 10 grand on this piece of crap, you know, um, but we we brought him back, and uh, I was still galloping at the time for myself. And, uh, you know, we felt the horse wasn't very good behind. We ran him back, I think, and he didn't run any good. But we really worked on, on getting his hind end right. We put draw reins on him and stuff like that. And he, he ran, we ran him at Calder on the way back, just before we went back to Kentucky. And I remember he won. And... Uh, you know, he, well, I didn't think much of it, Jonathan, but he did seem like a horse that the further he'd go, the better he'd get. And, um, and, uh, he, uh, he won a caller, like I said, and we brought him up to Kentucky and he ran a couple of really, really good allowance races. In fact, I can't recall the horse's name right now, but he ran second to a horse at Baffert's. Power broker. Power, Power broker. Power broker. That's him. Yep. Yeah. He, it was a horse. I think he belonged to Gary and Mary West, and and Power Broker was a Grade One winner. I think he broke his maiden in a in a Grade One, and and that kind of triggered it. I thought Jeez, this horse might be, uh, you know, we might have something here as we go along, and in his form, kind of petered out a little bit um, the rest of the year. And I think I backed off of him, brought him back the next year when we had him really right. And uh, and he won in the other then, if I'm not mistaken, late summer that year. And I think Mark bought into him maybe after that. Um, you know, the funny thing was, um, Jonathan, somebody in California tried to buy the horse as well around the same time. And um, they, I, I don't know, was it the horse's throat? He was asymmetric or something. You see, this is another thing. You know, you get a lot of these horses, they'll be asymmetric on the scope and uh, and people will knock them for it. But I've seen some very good horses that were asymmetric and it never bothered them. What, what but, does that mean? I don't want to cut you off on the, on the your role on the story. What is asymmetric, the, though, just for people that don't know? Just on the scope, they've got a, an odd-shaped epiglottis, an odd-shaped okay. airway. And, and you know, it it's probably a step towards paralysis, but a lot of horses don't paralyze. Um with it so i guess you're taking a chance to some extent but the guy who who was trying to buy him in california he 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 knocked them eventually and and he said yeah i can't get beyond the throat and and um i said that's a pity i said because uh you know we'll we'll win a breeders cup marathon with this horse next year and i promise you the when he won the breeders cup marathon that year he was the first man on the phone to me after he texted me and he said you were you were totally right but lucky enough it's it, like we said it's amazing how things work you know mark ended up buying into the horse um you know i i actually had a piece of the horse the whole time his his career um uh was there and he paid a lot of bills for me jonathan and he was a very important horse because we brought him to parks that fall 
and um, he won the Greenwood Cup. Um, and and you know he was I think he was twenty to one. Nobody expected it all. And uh, Miguel Mena, the Lord of Mercy on him, who who we lost last year. Miguel rode him. I couldn't get anybody to. I didn't know anybody in parks. I couldn't get anybody to go and and ride him. But Miguel popped up. He didn't ride a a ton of horses for me at the time, and uh, he won on him. And uh, I think we ran the horse back at Belmont that fall it was sloppy and and he got beat and then we brought him to uh to california for the the marathon and and he uh he managed to win the marathon coming from like he must have been 20 lengths back uh 17 is what the chart says but i i'm with you (laughs) yeah and it's funny because i was standing watching the race and angel cardero was beside me we were in that there's a little canopy at Santa Anita that a lot of people, where a lot of people watch races. And Angel was behind me, and the horse went by me the first time, and I thought, God, this horse! I'm after bringing him all the way out to California for him not to run a step. And Angel said to me, he said, "See your horse?" He said, "He might win." He said, "They're going way too fast." And by the time he got to the three eights, Paul, he was in front, and he won. He won maybe by the seventeen lengths. I'm not sure. It was probably not seventeen, but it was yeah. it was a pretty comfortable uh, comfortable win, and it was it was fantastic. Uh, nine and it's nine always, and a uh, half, nine and a half, which is yeah. close to seventeen. <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. So when you open up like great. that in a in a in especially in a marathon race like that, it's like yeah, no, it was fantastic, and uh, you know, like I said, he he was I I owned a piece of him my whole career, and. He probably, you know, of all the horses that we've had, John, and he's probably the horse that opened up more of a door for me than any horse um, that came after. You know, he was the first good horse I had. And, and I guess, you know, that's that's how you get out there and that's how people people take notice because the numbers definitely went up um, from, from there on. And, uh, you know, he was just a fantastic horse. Unfortunately, he got injured, I think, the year after. And, um, you know, that was, that was kind of it, but he, we found him a very good home. And to this day he's in, he's in Lexington and he's enjoying a good retirement. Um, there's a, a girl who's a veterinarian in Lexington that has him and, uh, you know, she's given him a great, uh, a great after career and, and, and he's, anytime she sends me photographs or what have you of him, he, he looks like he's, uh, he's really enjoying his retirement why you know looking at the past performances and watching you tell the story why was he so short of a price if mean, he was three to one and like you said this is kind of your coming out party so it's not like he was trained by diodoro who wins all these marathon races or it wasn't like it was some triple crown horse that you know todd decided to stretch out why did he go off at such a short price considering how you know, not how poorly he ran but the race in which he ran at Belmont. Why do you think he was so short? Was there buzz that week about him? What, what do you remember? Well, I guess, um, you know, I guess because he had won a Greenwood Cup and, and, and that. And um, I don't know, maybe the boys had had a lot of money on him. Who knows? But um, <laughs> yeah. Fergus. He, Old yeah, Fergus was probably. We'll blame, we'll blame Fergus again for that one. Yeah. Um, but no, um, it, it was, it was kind of funny, but I guess he, he did, he did win the, the Greenwood Cup awfully uh, impressive and his run in Belmont in between was not horrible either. Um, so I guess, you know, people felt that maybe he was the horse that, that was going to go the, uh, go the route of ground, you know? Um, so it's funny. <laughs> Uh, Mark the Temple, and this is my my favorite is when I get two stories from the same person, and they they said this, I'm, I'm sorry, two stories from from two different people. Uh, it, it happened with uh, uh, with Jacob West. I had Todd Pletcher and Michael McCarthy tell the same story to get to get me to tell, and 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 so with uh, Mark the Temple and Fergus both said that uh, once you guys won the marathon, it was one of the best days ever. That's what Mark the Temple said. And then Fergus said, it must have been one of Snapper's best days because I couldn't reach him for two days after that. 
See, this what, is a what was the celebration like? What was the celebration like? This is a controversial subject, um, Jonathan, because to this day he doesn't believe that you know when you've got 50, 40, 50,000 people at a Breeders' Cup, the cell phone reception is not very good. Um, so <laughs> what was what was funny was, um, you know, the the same weekend we had a Philly win in Canada, and and. Uh, she won a stake um, and Fergus was in a rush to get her back to Lexington for the sale um, so I guess he was trying to call me uh, the horse won on the Friday he was trying to call me on the Saturday and couldn't get through and I mean I got no calls at all on the Saturday contrary to what he might tell you um, but uh, we went back to back with the cool more guys on the Saturday night, back to a house that they were staying in. And my phone just absolutely blew up once I went into a reception area. And of course, I'm getting all these calls for, and texts from Fergus. Oh, call me, call me ASAP. What are you doing? They were getting more and more abusive as the as I was scrolling down the messages. Of course, <laughs> I, I will admit I was I was slightly intoxicated at this stage. Um, and um, as you should, well yeah, deserved. you know. But he he was trying to get the filly back to to Lexington for the sale, and I guess you know uh, he he managed to get it done anyway um, without much of my help, um, Jonathan. But even to this this day, I think he still holds it against me a little bit, you know. Um, but uh, yeah, that was the thing. We did. No, I won't. I won't deny it. We did have quite a celebration. But if you're not going to to celebrate something like that, especially back in them days, um, what are you going to celebrate? But Mark was part of it as well, so you know, um, I think he owned the filly too, or owned a good share of her. So, um, you know, it, it wasn't just me. He might have taken a lot of the sting off of me actually, because I know Mark had uh, had a lot of fun that that weekend as well. Um, I don't know if he told you about the taco shop incident or not, but um, no, this might... is this is this well, is beautiful. Like, let's go taco shop. No, let's I, go I don't know. Shop. I don't know if that's a story for for on here, um, Jonathan. We might we might have to discuss that in a in a more private. That's, that's situation fine. That's in fine. We'll, we'll 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 save that for round two. I mean, eventually but, I'm going to run out of guests, so I'm going to have to have people on twice. So we'll we'll yeah. save the taco shop for. Uh, uh, for an, for another day and and yeah I mean uh, 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 Fergus also he if you ever went in a snapper at the racetrack you can you can ask him about the taco uh, taco shop story and then yeah Fergus was, was he he was he was like I got one story but you probably can't do it on the airwaves I was like okay <laughs> <laughs> um another one that, that that was interesting to me was uh was was Fergus set me up with born great any uh -huh. a, a horse that you um i don't want to 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 spoil the, the the surprise here but a horse that you won with broke the maiden going six and a half at kentucky downs uh -huh. and uh fergus tells the story as calling you and asking you how did the horse come out of the race and you said good and then you said or he said like how good and he said, at that point, you realized what he was really asking you. Uh huh. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if he really asked me now, John, and I think I was told more than more than asked. <laughs> um, but you know, it was an unusual request. But you know, people do that kind of thing in Europe, and nobody blinks an eyelid. Um, you know, they'll back a horse up at some of these like the Galway meet or, or somewhere like that, or, or people that feel they're on, you know, it's obviously a different system in Europe, um, but if people feel they're on the right side of the handicapper before they get on the wrong side, you know, they'll bring a horse back and they'll run them two, sometimes three times within a week or 10 days. But yeah, we broke the maiden. It was a little unusual for over here, but broke the maiden. And I think, I think seven or eight days later, we ran him back in, in an A other than at Kentucky Downs and he won again. Um, but he was a horse that, that had taken an awful long time to, to come to hand. And, and, you know, he showed such a liking for, for Kentucky Downs. I guess um, we tried to make hay while the sun was shining and, and thankfully it worked out. But yeah, I, 
I do remember him calling me and and I was thinking, oh, what's he going to come up with now? Um, you know, we we call uh, Fergus the Sarm, Jonathan. Um, and and since it's it's become a almost a, a name, we've got Sarm one and Sarm two. But um, <laughs> it's just through a friend of mine, another another friend of mine who will remain uh, nameless in Ireland. Sarm stands for self appointed racing manager. <laughs> so, so we've I I have to deal with a lot of Sarms um, and and anybody. Anybody who who doesn't know us, they don't know what a sarm is. But now, obviously, once this gets on air, um, people will know what a what a sarm is, and I'm sure there'll be a lot of trainers that can that can relate to it um, because we we all have to deal with a lot of sarms, a lot of self appointed racing managers. So, oh but, my um, god, that's yeah. that's good. That people are gonna people are gonna enjoy that. I, I can think. I'm I'm, I'm laughing because. I can think of who those people are yeah. um, in lots of different situations. I can, you know, I'm thinking about my friends that are trainers and, and their big owners and who their SARMs are. And it's, uh, it's, it, it's funny. I know you, I know you say it in jest a little bit because Fergus actually is a racing manager, but uh, yeah, I, I, I get it. That's, 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 uh... <laughs> yeah, no, every, everybody gets a kick out of it. You know, um, Anybody that hears it for the first time, they get a laugh out of it. Sheikh Fahad actually loves it. He, <laughs> you know, I'd be, I'd be, I tell him sometimes, oh, I'm dealing with a lot of the Sarms here, and he, he gets a great kick out of it too. So I think it's going to be a universal uh, name now after, uh, after. Yeah, tonight. I hope so. We're going to, we're going to, we're going to, we're going to try to get it, get it rolling here. It, w- w- one of the things I thought about when I, when I looked at the Born Great thing, that I wanted to ask you about just for our horse players that listen. Um, Kentucky downs is tricky for me. I, 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 I turf racing is, is I, I consider it to be a little bit more random than dirt racing. I think dirt racing is very formful. I feel like if you get a clean trip, um, y- you know, the best horse often wins dirt races, but I think turf races because of the nature of, of turf racing, it, it, it can be a little bit more challenging. And then I think the next level of more challenging is Kentucky Downs because they're full field. So you're going to have trips, you're going to have these things. But I also think the configuration of that course is a whole nother variable to take into play. Um, if you were telling someone what kind of horse, uh, what kind of attributes a horse that likes Kentucky Downs, what, what kind of attributes they have, or if you want to go the other way of what attributes does a horse lack, that, that make them not run well at Kentucky Downs. What are your kind of feelings and thoughts about that course and, and how it, it plays? I think um, around there, you know, they've, they've got to be an athletic type of horse. Um, they've obviously got to like fast ground because, you know, I know sometimes it can come up uh, – a little soft and sometimes you get the rain and that but for the most part it gets quite firm around there and and when it does get firm it gets firm firm um you know so it's fast ground but i think they do have to be quite athletic i think it's a even though you know we've managed to do it it's a hard place to win with a first time or like a first time two-year-old that have no experience because i think the undulations knock them off balance but on the same hand i think it's a great experience for a young horse um you know you see a lot of horses that have run there they come back and they if they've run decent they'll come back and they'll run really well next time out i think they learn learn an awful lot um you know it's been a lucky track for me why why i don't know um i guess i've i've got plenty plenty grass horses and and we've been we've been lucky around there you know like we were saying earlier on with Sheikh Fahad, he brought over um you know two nice horses from europe to to win the the three year old sprint down there uh, most recently the Learjet who was a very very good horse in Europe anyway um, you know and I think if they're used to the undulations of the the gallops and the tracks in in Europe I think that gives them quite an advantage as well um, but definitely they need to be athletic and and they need to like the uh, the fast ground but it's a it's a tough place to handicap super tough place to handicap because you get you get all kinds of results down there, you know. 
Yeah, and, and, and do, you, do you find yourself pointing towards it now because of the money? Uh, or, you know, I mean, obviously you want to win at Keeneland. Um, especially your operations and, and you have, you have well-bred horses, whether they're, they're mares or they're, they're colts. So winning in front of that audience is always a good audience to win in front of. Um, but do you find yourself pointing to Kentucky Downs because of the money? Yeah, I mean, we do. We, we, you know, obviously Sheikh Fahad's a big client of mine. Um, he, he likes the place. He even came down and, and, and attended the races there last year for a couple of days um, so it's it's a lot of fun. Obviously, the money is is a lot of fun too. If you can get your hands on it, um, you know it's it's uh, yeah. I mean, it's gotten it's gotten huge, really, uh, comparison to what it was. Um, and and I guess yeah, because of the money. But it's become very competitive now too. And you need a good horse to win uh, to win at Kentucky Downs. Um, you know, the standard wasn't as high years ago. But obviously, you you bring the money as. As has become the way with Kentucky in general, I think, Jonathan. You know, you've an awful lot of the, um, you know, a lot of the bigger outfits now moving towards Kentucky, and and you know, uh, you put the money up, and 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 they'll come, um, and it's been a big boost for for Kentucky racing, as it should be, because you know the the best horses in the world are Kentucky breeds, and and you know the racing the and the standard of racing I feel should follow. So. Um, you know, it's one of the factors again in in Kentucky that that that's making it the place to uh, the place to be. Well, well, be, before I let you go here, I'm going to selfishly tell you about two horses that you trained that I I I loved, uh, and, and they're not like these over the top types, but Temple City Terror, who um, made me smart on TV one day. Uh, mm-hmm. I, I was bullish when she broke her maiden at Churchill. And she, you know, she was, you know, five to two that day. It wasn't like she was whatever, but I was, I was bullish. I loved her. And then I chased her in a lot of her subsequent starts and just kept mm-hmm. chasing her and kept chasing her. And then I finally got rewarded when she won at seven to one. And then I've just been chasing her, chasing her, chasing her. And then she just really found her home going longer on the grass. Uh, just tell me a little bit about Temple City Terror. Yeah, she's been amazing, Jonathan. She, you know, she's this and Whenever you have a horse like her that's been in the barn for years, um, they become your favorites. You know, she's just a like she, you know, she's undescribable. I mean, she's gone from, you know, I think she she took nine, nine starts to break her maiden. I mean, I, I have to admit, like I was getting ready to run her for for a tag, um, you know, because she she was she was getting close and she was knocking on the door but it took her forever but once she broke her maiden and once we stretched her out um she's turned into the most fantastic mare and and i think now it's not so much even the stretch out i think she's just a very um she's just a very good filly like she just she's just matured so well she never has a bad day she loves to train goes out there with a march on every day and she just you know she's one of the the type, she's the type of horse that we all we all fall in love with because she just you know she's a trainer's dream um you know and she's gotten from strength to strength and i think you know she's a seven year old now we still have her um you know she's not a million miles away from from making her first start for this year and i can't see why she couldn't have a very very good uh seven year old career uh, year as as much as anything i we've managed to to uh to keep her in training and and you know i i think she's just getting better jonathan so i can't see why she couldn't have a her best year ever this year again january 28th 2017 i i wonder that if we were friends at that point if i would have texted you that morning and i would have said hey snapper you got this ghost zapper filly in at gulfstream uh, do you like her? What What would you have told me when she when uh, Proctor's Ledge went off at forty nine to one? I think I'd have told you that she might have been in the first five or six. <laughs> um, I was actually on my way. It was funny. I was on my way to Ireland, um, and it was the greatest day. I, I I think I was going home on vacation, and and I was going through New York. 
And when I landed in New York, I turned my phone on, it blew up. And I thought, oh, this must be, this is either very good news or very bad news. And uh, uh, everybody was on about Proctor's Ledge. Congratulations. I think she was 50 to 1. Um, you know, we when I got to Ireland that night, I had another stakes winner at, at the fairgrounds. So that's why I kind of remember the day even more. But um, but when she won her A other than Jonathan, I guess it was about a month later, and she absolutely trounced um, her opposition that day. That's when I thought, you know, we're onto something here because that that filly was one of the very few that didn't show us an awful lot at home. Um, you know, I ran her again. Miguel Mena rode her first time out at Churchill. I think it was November of her two year old year, and uh, mm-hmm. she was just very immature. And Miguel came back. She she kind of ran around the back of the field and passed a few horses at the end. And he he said to me, he said, "This filly's all right." And I said, "Really?" And he's like, "Yeah." He said, "I think this filly could be okay." And uh, we brought her to Florida that winter and, and she was working away, but I didn't think she was anything special. But just with racing, John, and like she won that day, she came out and she absolutely won with her mouth open in her A other then. And that's when I thought, you know, we're onto something here. And uh, I think we brought her back in, in Keeneland and ran her in the, in the Philly stake at Keeneland. And she ran a decent race. She got struck into that day, I remember, and didn't get a very good trip. But, you know, the rest is history with her. I mean, she was a hell of a hell of a filly. She won the, the two lake, as we call them, the two lake races for the three-year-old fillies at Saratoga that um, that fall and, and or that summer. And, uh, you know, won the, won the mile race at Churchill the following year. So we had we had some great days with her, Jonathan. But, you know, more than anything, she belonged to Trish Mosley, who I had my very first winner, uh, Sandcastle, with. And, uh, you know, she's been, you know, you talk about owners and everything, but she's been the most fantastic owner um, the whole way along. She supported me. And, and to have a filly as good as Proctor's Ledge for, for somebody like her was was probably a, a, a bigger factor than anything, you know. So the last thing I'm going to leave you with before before we get out of here and and look this could go somewhere it couldn't go anywhere but i'm going to try um i reached out to tom morley because i know you guys had worked together and been friends and i and 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 i told tom i was having you on and he he was so excited he said call me tomorrow at three i said well i said tom i'm having them today and he said oh i just got done with a quail hunt so we never got to connect so I want to just invite you to tell what story you think Tom wanted to get me on the phone for. Oh, God. <laughs> I've, got, I've got an idea, but um, I don't know. Again, I don't know if this should be, <laughs> should be shared among the general public, but uh, <laughs> he, he was probably off with his knickerbockers shooting poor quail anyway. Um, <laughs> Jonathan, you know, with his tweeds on, um, but uh, yeah, no, God knows what uh, what he was going to come up with there. But uh, I've got a good few stories on him as well. So if he does come up with anything and and he's on the show at some at some uh, stage, don't hesitate to uh, to call me about him because yeah, I've, I'm gonna, I've, got, I'm gonna... I've, I've got some pretty pretty I've got some beauties on him now. I can guarantee you that. <laughs> Oh, I can only imagine. I can only mm-hmm. imagine. Brendan, I, I really appreciate you taking the time. It's been a lot of fun. This is what the show is for, right? It's like I, I, I want people to, uh, uh, to, to, to see the, the, the other side. I, you know, the, the interviews of, of how did your horse just run and how is your horse going to run. They're very limiting, uh, as it were. So uh, I appreciate you taking the time. Not at all. Not at all, John, any time. That was fun. We got we, we to get these stories. A lot of stories. We we edited out a lot of stories, it seems. So we're gonna have to we're gonna have to reach back and find those stories. Um, uh, I want to thank Brendan for taking the time. Uh, it was a ton of fun, a ton of fun to to, to talk. I you know a, a lot of times when I when I get when I go into these, if, if there are people I know really well, like people that are like my friends, like 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 people that I've that that I've called and and been sad about life events with, right? Um, not that Brendan's not a friend; he's a friend for sure. But you, you know what I'm saying. 
when I have those people on, I know that I can go for a very long time. I know so much about them and I can dig and we can keep rolling and rolling. There's people that I don't know as well who I consider friends as well, but you, you don't ever know how long it's going to go. And uh, this one was sneaky. This one snuck up on me. This this one rolled. We 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 did uh we did some pretty good time. I hope everyone enjoyed it. Um, I'm going to thank everyone on the network. Last week, I I kind of kind of got out of there unscathed because we had such a serious topic. And thank you so much to everyone who uh, chimed in to to listen to that topic uh, about uh, the life of a jockey, the mental and physical impacts uh, of a rider. And also just mental health in general. Um, very proud of what we put out, and, and thank you to Lafitte. It's been Kai the Third and Richie Migliori. If you missed that, check that out. Um, but I also want to thank everyone else on the network. Pete, uh, Drew, who, who's won a BCBC, and, and, and I've only run second twice, which is you know pretty close, but not as good. Um, Acacia, Maggie, Spencer, Matt Bernier. Uh, Billy, Michelle, I'm forgetting people, aren't I? Whatever. Whatever. I'm sorry. Um, thanks so much for tuning in. Thank you to Brendan Walsh. Thank you again to Qatar Racing. We'll see you next week. I need to know everything. Who in the what and the where I need everything. Trust me, I hear what you're saying, but I like it's new what you're telling me. I'm curious, George, I hop in the Porsche, there's five and a horse, I'm ready for war, I'm coming for throws, to turn to a ghost, I need to know everything. Now you be surprised at the info you get is by letting them talk, so I'm letting them talk. Gotta keep quiet, maneuver in silence, then let them in, talk up their body, another one body, that's just how it go. I got some secrets, I'm shaking the game so they stay on their toes, stay in your lane, not to stay on the go. I can to play with the pros and act like a rookie, so they overlook me, then I double up again, none of their knows, none of them cold. They just got lucky, but never adapted, so I'm to the one if it's coming to blows. My enemies cutting it close, I let them think that they got me, but what do you know? I had them beat before we ever spoke, I'm ready for smoke. I need to know everything, who in the what and the where I need everything Trust me, I hear what you're saying, but I like it's new what you're telling me I'm curious, George, I hop in the Porsche, there's five and a horse I'm ready for war, I'm coming for throws, to turn to a ghost I need to know everything Now they ain't go harder than me, they need a blade and a sheath A shank and a piece, a crate full of heat, an army of fleet A tank and a jeep, a navy at sea, where they a marine, an ace up their sleeve A team of marines, a freak on a leash, a beast with an appetite, razor for teeth, and still they will lay at my feet. Boy, you got the wrong one. I gotta look over all of my publishing statements for Q1 as soon as the song's done. I gotta call up my mama and tell her I made it as soon as my log's done. I gotta read all my trade publications and sit my teeth till it is all done. I think it's all fun. I need to know everything. Who in the what and the where I need everything. Trust me, I hear what you're saying, but I like it's new what you're telling me. I'm curious, George, I hop in the Porsche, there's five and a horse, I'm ready for war, I'm coming for throws, to turn to a ghost, I need to know everything. I need to know everything, who in the what and the where, I need everything. Trust me, I hear what you're saying, but I like it's new what you're telling me. I'm curious, George, I hop in the Porsche, there's five and a horse, I'm ready for war, I'm coming for throws, to turn to a ghost, I need to know everything.